why do you have a reservation? Good morning. How many of you are like me and you're a foodie? Any got any foodies in this room? All right, I see those hands. All right, I'm looking for some recommendations for good seafood. I got some good taco spots this first service, but where's some good seafood spots? Shout them out to me. No one, no one eats seafood. Okay, come on. Season 52. All right. What else? Anyone else? Good seafood. Blue water. Oh, I don't know that I've been there. Okay, what else? One more. Sea level. Sea level. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. You guys have now given me three new places to try. I appreciate it. Now, how many of you know when you get a recommendation from someone, the more they pump it up, the more higher your expectations are. So someone's like, okay, you got to go try this place. It is going to change your Life. Right, right? Change your life. You're like, so you're walking in, you're like, okay, this halibut is going to change my life. And suddenly your expectation is through the roof and it's pretty easy to get disappointed, right? Or you read a Yelp review and they're like, the best California burrito, which by the way, it is not a California burrito. I believe it's a San Diego burrito because I was in LA and they didn't have any California burritos in LA. So you guys can keep calling it the California, but it's the San Diego burrito, okay? That was totally not in my notes. Um, <laughs> but when you're just walking around town and you need to grab something to eat, you have no re prerequisites, no explanation, and you just walk in. Maybe the place doesn't even look right, but suddenly you're eating a dish that was fantastic and your expectations, now you had no expectations, and you're like, wow, this was a really good meal that I was not expecting. It's so true in our lives. When we have high expectations for things, we can be disappointed. But when we walk through life, and some of us do walk with no expectations from people, from food, from experiences, from our job, maybe no expectations from life, it's pretty hard to be disappointed because you had no expectations, right? It's the same with God. We read God's word and we're filled with confidence of the kinds of things and miracles that God does. We see his word, miracles, life change, transformation, and our expectations with God can be really high. But our reality doesn't always meet those expectations. And so even with God, we can face disappointment. As we're in this series about hearing from God, I believe that God can speak to us in profound ways when we're disappointed with him when we're disappointed with how things have shaken out, when we've been disappointed with a diagnosis or a circumstance in our life. And so my prayer today for each one of us is that whatever that place in your life where you faced disappointment, maybe in the past, maybe right now you're facing something currently where you're like, this is not what I had planned. God, this is not who I thought you were. My prayer is that in that disappointment, you would allow God to speak to you, to give you what you need and your relationship with him would grow. We're going to be looking today in a story in 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. And this person, I would say, experienced some pretty great disappointment. Now, just before this uh, story, we have the prophet Elijah. Elijah is one of the prophets. And if you study the book of First and Second Kings... This is the period in the time of Israel when they were ruled by, guess what? Kings. There were kings in charge of Israel. See, Israel, they were uh, God's chosen people, and they said, we want to look like everyone else. All the other kingdoms have a king. Lord, would you give us a human king? And so God gave them what they asked for, and it didn't turn out very well. A few of the kings were good. Most of the kings were were bad. They were evil. They did not follow after God. They did not keep honoring God with their, with their, they did not hold his covenants. And so they would take the entire nation of Israel away from God. And this point in our story, the now the nation of Israel is divided. So now there's not just one bad king, there's two bad kings. And this one in our story is the worst. 
Elijah is the prophet at the time. And just before this story, we have seen Elijah see incredible miracles from God. He saw God cause droughts and then cause rain. He saw um, oil and flour multiplied. He saw a dead son raised to life. This is the things that Elijah has seen. And just before this story is a story on Mount Carmel. If you don't know this story, read it. It's in 1 Kings 18. There's on the top of the mountain, I'm going to summarize it the best I can for you. On this mountaintop, see King Ahab had brought in pagan worship. So they were worshiping a false god called Baal, B-A-A-L. And that is what, they had all of these prophets that were worshiping this pagan god. And then he married someone, Queen Jezebel, who also believed in pagan worship. So now you've got the two people running the nation of Israel, leading God's people that are inviting in pagan worship. And not just pagan worship, but they are slaughtering the prophets of God. All of the people that were like Elijah, they were killing off. They were getting rid of God in the kingdom. And so what does Elijah do? God sends Elijah to King Ahab and says, all right, I'm putting out the gauntlet right now. This is what we're going to do. You bring all your prophets of Baal onto this mountain and you set up an altar. And I want to see you pray to your God to see if he will bring fire down on the altar. And Elijah says, so I am also going to set up an altar and I'm going to pray to the God of Israel, to my God, the God of, of Jacob, that he would send down fire and destroy the altar. And so what happens on this mountaintop? Well, it's what you think. All of these prophets of Baal are praying to their God. Would you bring down fire? Bring down fire. And nothing happens. Everyone is watching them. King Ahab is here. The prophets are there. And Elijah, not only does he set up the altar, but he sends water all along the altar and prays for fire to come down from heaven, from the sky, from nowhere. And the entire altar is burned down. God's powerful miracle is shown. People turn their hearts to God. But this is how Ahab responds. This story is how Ahab responds to watching that miracle of God. God showed his power right there in that moment. And this is what happens. Verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. You see, right after this, Elijah sacrificed all of those Baal prophets because he wanted to purify God's people and to, to get rid of all the people that were going to draw them away from God. So this is Jezebel's response. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. She threatened his life. She said, That's what you're going to do? You're dead. She set out a hit on Elijah. And so Elijah was like, Wait, what? Okay, God. So there's this powerful miracle and now my life is in jeopardy. We're going to pick back up our story. Verse 3. So when, then Elijah became afraid. Uh, yeah, the most powerful people in the kingdom were now hunting him down. And immediately he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. Now he's on his own. But he went a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Lord... Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Elijah was like, God, I have nothing to live for. This didn't turn out the way I thought it should have turned out, God. And now my life's in jeopardy. Have you ever felt done before? Verse 5. Then Elijah lay down and he slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him. The angel told him, get up and eat. Then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread breaked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him, and he said, get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. So Elijah got up, ate, and drank. And then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. You see, when it comes to hearing the voice of God, he will often use our pain, our disappointments, to draw us closer to him. 
so that we can hear him better and so that we can be strengthened. But we have to allow adversity to deepen our dependence on God. We've got to allow it to deepen it. You see, Elijah desperately needed God's provision. He was done. He thought there was nothing more that he could do for God. Like, okay, God, we see this powerful miracle. You had this drought for three years. The drought's now over. Fire literally came from heaven and everyone saw it. Why didn't you turn the king's heart? How did the king's heart not become turned from you? God, I did everything you asked. I prayed. I followed you. I served your word. I did everything you wanted me to do, Lord. And the kingdom is still not devoted to you? How did Ahab not give his life to you in that moment? (sighs) Elijah thought it was him. There must be something wrong with me then. Because obviously, I'm not the man of God. I couldn't make, I couldn't get it done, God. The kingdom is still not devoted to you. So I might as well. And Elijah, in this desperate situation, he needed God. He needed him desperately. Look at his, look at how he prays. I have had enough, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. You see, right before this verse, he was literally praying that God would end his life. That's what it says in the verse. He was praying that God would end his life. He was so done. You don't think there's despair in the kingdom of God? You don't think there's desperation? This is a story that shows us that we can be faithful, we can be godly Christ followers, honoring before God, and still we can face despair and disappointment. Still we can question if anything was worth it, if we were worth anything. You see, this shows us people in despair in the Bible. I was studying up on this, and uh, did you know that between the ages of 10 and 24, that age group, the second leading cause of death is suicide. If you talk to anyone in that age group, many of them, especially the older ones, know someone who has taken their life by suicide. It's an epidemic in our country. It's an epidemic with with the youth. There is pain and suffering. But what we see from this story is Elijah didn't stay in that place. Elijah could have just found a way to end it. But what what happens? Look how God, look how God meets him. He's alone in the desert, given up on everything, and God sends him an angel. Angel Lord, he returned for a second time. This is the second time. And he said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. God said, I'm not done with you. I, you may think this is the end of the story, but I am not done with you. There is more I have for you. And if you have ever felt in that dark place, that's God's word for you today. God is not done with you. There is more that God has for you. You are not so lost and so desperate and so alone that God doesn't have something else for you. Get up and eat. God has another journey for you. Amen. But you know what Elijah did? He ate. It was a simple act. He could have refused to eat the food. He could have just said, I'm done. But no, Elijah ate. He received what God gave to him. He received the gift that God had provided for him. Alone in the desert, God sent an angel to feed him, but Elijah had to take the step to eat, didn't he? Some of us are saying, my marriage is in crisis, but you won't see a counselor. Some of you are sick, but you won't see a doctor. Some of you are facing loneliness and despair, and you won't surround yourself with God's people to support you and care for you. God wants you to eat. 
He's provided you with the answers. Now, I'm not saying that just because you have gotten help that there aren't still struggles. Some of you have seen the doctor and you still can't find the answer. Some of you have gotten the counseling and you're still struggling. But for those of us in this room who are waiting on the line saying, I'm struggling, but we're not taking the step to get the help. God's saying, get the help. Go out and reach the resource that God's placed around you. And some of you, it's just going across this room and finding that person that's going to be. That's why we believe in life groups. We want you to be surrounded by men and women who want to come alongside you and pray for you and support you when you're struggling, to care for you. We want to supply you with resources to help you when you're struggling. But you know what we want most of all? We want your dependence on God to be the source. You, when you're in pain, when you're in despair, our dependence is not on ourselves. It's not on anyone in this room. They can be a tool that God uses, but our dependence is on God. That's when you're at the bottom, it's you and God at the end of the day. And your dependence is on him. You see, Elijah had that choice to eat or not. And he chose to eat. You see, despair and disappointment can crush us or it can take us to a new place of dependence on him. Before I was uh, on staff here, I had an awesome job. I was working, it's called the SoCal Network. And we, uh, the what we did was we work with all a bunch of churches, about 400 churches in Southern California that we would do training for. And my area was over our youth. And so I would put on trainings for youth pastors and youth leaders. That's actually how I got to meet Pastor. You were the youth, you were doing multiple things, but you were like worship and youth at the same time. That's how I got to meet Pastor Marcus. And uh, we our, I would put on youth convention and summer camps. And that's what I did. And it was a, a hard job because it required a lot of travel. I had young kids, but I really felt like I was doing what God had called me to do. It was an amazing job. And then COVID hit. And one of the things about that office is most of the jobs at that office were paid for by events. And so when COVID happened and the events went away, guess where the income went? Away. Those of you who were had in businesses that were negatively impacted for COVID, you can relate. It was a scary time, and many nonprofits really struggled during COVID. And so they had to make the difficult decision. I was one of the newer people on the staff. Many of the people there had been there for 15, 20 years. I had been there for about two and a half years in that role. And they had to make the decision to lay off about a third of the staff. And I was one of the people that was laid off. So it was May of 2020, we're talking the middle of COVID, schools aren't back in yet, in Los Angeles County, where certainly churches were not gathering, there was, there was, nothing was open, and now I'm facing unemployment. I'm facing going from feeling called and inspired for, for God to saying, what now, Lord? And what's hard is, uh, right before I had been there, I was, we still uh, were a part of the church where I had been on staff prior to that job. I had been the executive pastor and then went and worked for uh, the SoCal Network. And three months before COVID, I helped my church replace my position, my former position. I'm like, okay, God, you clearly shut the door because I can't even complain that I helped fill that position. But Lord, shut the door. That's what I would have done. I had been there for 11 years. We had, were still very involved in that church. I, that's where I would have gone, but God had closed that door. And so I was sitting there thinking, feeling like I'm on the edge of a cliff, going from two incomes to one income, I'm in Los Angeles County during COVID. What, do you think there were many churches in Los Angeles County hiring during COVID? Yeah. The answer is no. There was like no churches hiring. And so we started looking outside of Los Angeles. I mean, my prayerfully, my husband, we did not want to move. We had just got bought a house. We had a kids in a great school, even though it was online at the moment. It was still a good school. Like I had a 13 year plan that involved staying right there. That was not part of my plan was to move or do anything else. And suddenly I'm like, okay, God, I start looking at secular positions. Maybe um, I'll go into teaching or I'll become a man. I, I started panicking. Like, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? And a part of me thought, I may have to give up on ministry. 
I may have to give up on being a pastor because I don't see a way forward. And about two months of this, nothing. I mean, I had a, a handful of interviews that were via Zoom. My husband jokes with me, one of the places was up in Fresno, and he, he's told me now, he's like, well, you would have gone there, but we were staying in California. We were staying in SoCal. No, this on Fresno, but it's... And then God opened the door for us to come to New Break. And I remember when we came here, I was like, God, I would have just been happy to keep serving you, but you have gone above and beyond what I could have ever put together by coming to such an incredible church with an incredible staff. It was, it was beyond what I could have ever imagined God had put together for me. But I'll tell you, those two and a half months before I got, before I got hired here were terrifying. But you know what I know now? I know what it's like to lose a job. I know what it's like to be laid off. And so when someone else is experiencing that, I know exactly the fear that they're feeling. And I can share with them the faith of trusting God, that God, maybe he's going to turn this into something better than you could have even imagined. And I don't always know how the story is going to end, but I know that I can depend on God. Walking through that strengthened my dependence on him. This is my question for you. Are you going to allow the things that have happened in your life to be your witness to others. I actually did not want to share this story with anyone because it's embarrassing. No one likes to know that they were laid off. Like that's not the best, like, hey, I was laid off before. But you know what I knew? I knew that I've experienced something, a disappointment in life, a disappointment that was out of my control that I can share with someone else to know I've been there. No, not everything has gone great in my life. Not everything has gone the way I would have planned or what I expected, but I know I can trust God. I know that God has always been faithful and I can trust him. I trust him yesterday, I can trust him today, and I can trust him tomorrow. And I don't know what's on the other side of tomorrow, but I know I can depend on him. And that difficult time that I went through deepened my relationship with him. It deepened our marriage as we wrestled through together, trying to hear from God, trying to discern what he was doing. And just like Elijah, it was kind of sim We were in this similar situation where we experienced this change of place. We went from having our plan together to now we didn't know. I went from being employed to unemployed. It was a place I had never been before, where I had purpose every day and I had what I, my plan, what I was working for, to suddenly I'm like, what is my purpose? It's, it, when you're in a job, I was talking to someone after the first service, when you're in a job, you're, you're accomplishing something, you're, you're, you're working towards something, and then when you're not, there's this kind of emptiness. And those of you who have retired or are nearing retirement, that's something very similar. You're like, well, what am I going to continue to contribute? It's this weird place. But God takes us to a new change of place so that we can know, as uh, Nate mentioned, like our foundation is him. It's not our employment or what we do or who, who we are is in him, not what we do even for him. Like, I am still just Joanne, a Christ follower, before I'm a pastor. At the end of the day, that's, that's my identity. My identity is in, in him and not what I do for him. Even though it's wonderful and I, I feel blessed that I get to do these things for him. The next thing that God can use to allow us to hear from him is a change of pace. I went from really busy and chaotic to now I had a little extra time on my hands. I'm not going to lie. I have full confession here. Um, I read a book to try to help me with this new change of pace. It was called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it talks about, you know, finding more pause in your life and allowing life to slow you down. And I listened to the book on Audible while I organized my garage. <laughs> it was a good... changed my life. <laughs> Our change of pace can help us hear from God. Sometimes we're going so fast in our lives that we don't just spend enough time just hearing from God. We're hurry, 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 on to the next, on to the next, on to the next, that we need to slow down enough 
Or when things are, you know, things in our life have slowed down a little bit, that we can take those as opportunities to connect with God and deepen our relationship with him and hear from him. God will also use a change of perspective. God will change our place, change of pace, and a change of perspective. Now that I know what it's like to experience that kind of loss of being laid off, it gives me a sensitivity to be able to share with others and a perspective I hadn't had before. See, the things that you've walked through have given you a fresh perspective. And if you have walked through some hard things, can I say you are equipped to help others who have walked through those hard things? There's things that I have not personally experienced that I cannot journey. I mean, I can journey with someone, but I still don't know what they are experiencing. Some of you have experienced hard things, and that means that God has equipped you in your perspective to reach others who have walked through those hard things. Would you let God use those things? You can keep your pain, your disappointments to yourself, or you can allow God to use it to help someone else. And I think if you're ever stuck in your life, stuck in um, a rut, maybe in your faith, we recommend, and as does the Bible recommend, Sabbath, that you take time to rest. Rest allows you to be thankful for what God's given you, to reflect to restore, to rejuvenate, or that's like once a week, you should be doing some sort of Sabbath. And with young kids, Sabbath doesn't necessarily look like 24 hours of silence. <laughs> it's enjoying, enjoying God's creation and his blessing and setting aside uh, work. So maybe, you know, leave a couple of dishes in the sink. Don't fold that laundry. You know, try to just enjoy the blessing of the family that God's given you or the friendships that you have. If you're single, go out and enjoy the friendships you have. Live in this beautiful city you live in. What does it look like for you to Sabbath and to give your time to God, reflecting and celebrating what God's given you? And then another great way to do it is to go on some sort of mountain retreat. Going away for a weekend to a mountaintop gives you a whole new place, pace, and perspective that God can speak to us when we kind of get outside of our routine and our normal, our normal things. You see, God wants to reawaken us. He wants to restore us, and he wants to speak to us in the midst of all of this. You see, Elijah experienced all of these. He was in this new place with a slower pace, and God gave him a new perspective. Let's jump into our story and see how it continues. Verse 9. Elijah entered a cave there and spent the night. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They are looking for me to take my life. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. And so at that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, he knew the voice of God. He knew this is where God's going to speak. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats the same thing he had already said. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, he replied. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're looking for me to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. The next couple of lines, I'm just going to summarize this. God is essentially giving Elijah very specific instructions about who is going to be anointed leader next, who's going to be the king, and who's going to be the prophet. God already has the next step in plan. He already has the next thing ready to go, already lined up. 
And verse 18, but I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that is not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. You see, God didn't show up in the fire like he had on Mount Carmel or the wind or the earthquake. God showed up in the whisper, the quiet voice to Elijah to give him the direction. When was the last time you leaned in to hear the quiet voice of God? In your darkest moments, in your busiest days, don't ever miss out on the opportunity to lean in to the voice of God. He wants to speak to us always. And if we'll allow him, if we'll give him the space to speak to us, he will redirect us. We have to let God's voice redirect us. God had a new mission for Elijah. He had a new plan for Elijah. See, when I'm experiencing pain and disappointment, what voice am I listening to? What voice are you listening to? Some of us, our internal dialogue is not always right. And it's true in this story as well. In this story, what did Elijah believe? He said that he was the only one left, right? That's what he said in his prayer. He said it twice. I alone am left. Was that true? What was the truth? Verse 18, how many were left? 7,000. Elijah had it wrong. Sometimes what we think in our mind is not always the truth. My husband and I, we were listening to an a audiobook talking about self-talk. And one of the things that it talked about was, um, if, take your self-talk and make it a person, a friend sitting next to you, and tell me, do you like that friend or not? <laughs> I'm like, that's actually really helpful. Like, that's actually, you're a terrible friend. <laughs> Some of us, our internal dialogue is not the voice of God. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe your parents had really high expectations of you. And so guess what? Your internal dialogue is probably really hard on yourself. Or maybe it's a, a boss or someone else in your life that was really hard on you. And that's the voice that you hear, is that voice. But that may not be the voice of God. See, one of the ways that we combat those negative things is getting into his word. The Bible talks about daily renewing your mind and making sure that the words and the voices that we are hearing that we're allowing to speak to us and direct us aren't directing us down the wrong path. We want those voices to uplift us, to encourage us, to build our faith. And God's word can guide you and strengthen you and pour over you. Renew your mind through his word and through prayer. Because if your prayers are sounding more like you than him, I'm going to encourage you to stop praying and just start reading his word. Just pick up the, pick up the word of God and let, that, let those prayers be your prayers. The prayers of those in the Bible that, wanna, that your faith and trust and confidence in him. And eventually then, your self-talk, Lord willing, will be sound more like his voice as you hear his voice. I've never audibly heard the voice of God. That's not been my experience, but I believe that I've heard from God. Sometimes you, I would call it like an impression. I feel like God's like impressed something on me. And one of the ways that I, I discern if that is that is I share it with someone and discern, is that, did I hear from God? Is that the voice of God? You see, perhaps it was Elijah's internal voice that brought him to where he was. You know, the fear, discouragement, but God didn't want to leave him there. You see, look at this. Voice, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Go and return by the way you came. He's like, I didn't tell you to leave that place. I didn't tell you I was done with you. Elijah, I want you to go back from where you came from. Go back and go back the way you came. But you know what's interesting about this? God didn't even promise him safety, did he? He said, I just want, I want you to go. But Elijah heard the voice of God and he responded and he did what God called him to do. 
But you know what else God said to him? He asked him, I love, every time you see something multiple times in the Bible, it's good to kind of clue in on it. God asked Elijah twice, what are you doing here? It's like, why are you in this place? Why are you here? I believe he did it with love and compassion. Maybe not as sarcastically as I'm saying it, but (laughs) what are you doing here? For some of you, for some of us, we're stuck. And I think God's saying to you, what are you doing here? You know there's somewhere else I have for you. You know there's some, you know you're not supposed to be in this place. And yet, what are you doing here? And Elijah responded the same way. Well, God, I'm alone. God, I'm alone. There's something else I have for you. Go. Go and return. Because there's something else for you. You see, if we let God, he can work through our pain. Our pain, our failures, our disappointments, they can be redeemed. Don't you want your pain to be worth something? (laughs) You're like, if I got to walk through it, hopefully it can at least help someone. But I'm just, I'm reminded in this story, again, Ahab didn't turn his heart to God. The reality is there is evil and pain and sickness in this world. And until we get to heaven, it's not going to be perfect. It's not perfect here. And so that leaves that gap of where we think things should be and how things should be and where reality is. You see, but it's in our pain that God can speak the loudest. It's in our pain and in our disappointments that you can learn more about yourself and more about God than when we're having a great day. I've, I've shared this story here before, but I, 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with a, a benign brain tumor. It's called an acoustic neuroma. And it caused all kinds of uh, problems, facial numbness, hearing loss. And God's been so faithful in helping me, um, you know, not, symptoms not get worse. I'm due for an MRI this week. I appreciate your prayers. Uh, but I, it's not life-threatening, but it's life-altering, potentially. And there's been days where I've not really wanted to go in and keep going and seeing the doctor because it's like, I don't really want to know if it's getting worse. I'm, my prayer, it's been so far been stable. So that's, I thank God for that. But you know what? Every time I go in for an MRI for all these 10 years, you know what my prayer has been? Okay, God, I'm going in for that MRI, Lord. I want to see that tumor disappear. That's my prayer. God, I want to go in and I want the, the tech to, for me to come out and be like, what were we getting a scan of? Like, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that's going on in my mind. Lord, please, I, one day I just want to walk in and be like, I don't know what tumor you were talking I've seen him do it. I've, you've probably heard the stories too of those miraculous healings. And God, Lord, I want the miraculous healing. And every time I go in and I don't get that, I have to kind of reset. Okay, well... God, you didn't give me that miraculous healing. I know you can. I don't understand why you can't, Lord. If you give me that miraculous healing, I'm going to share that story and you will get the glory. You will get the honor. And yet he doesn't answer that prayer. I still struggle with the healing loss or the hearing loss. So if you're ever on this side of me, like, and you're talking to me and I don't respond, I promise I'm not rude. I just can't hear you. (laughs) And what's weird is if you have hearing in one ear but not the other, you can't localize sound. So someone could be like, hey, and I'll have to do a 360 to know where you are because I don't know where the voice is coming from. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. But you know what? I had never experienced sickness really until this. Wow. So it's given me a softness that when someone's facing a diagnosis, their mind goes all the dark places. And there's times where I can allow that voice as I'm getting ready for the MRI to be like, what, what if it's turned into cancer? What if it's gotten bigger? What if I go to go in for brain surgery? What if I ultimately die because of this brain tumor? All of those voices are still there. But you know what I do now? When those voices come up, God, I've trusted you before and I trust you. And even if it takes my life, I'm going to trust you. We're not guaranteed health We're not guaranteed life without pain and struggle. But we're guaranteed that we have a God who wants to meet us in that pain. 
a God who loves you. And if there's someone in your life that's hurting, don't you want to be near to them? That's how God feels about you. He wants to take your struggle and he wants to be near to you. Or he wants to use you to be his hands and feet in their pain and in their struggle. I'm going to invite Nate to come. We're going to end uh, with this song. I, uh, I still listen to the radio. I'm aging myself. And there's this song, uh, as I was preparing this message the last couple of weeks, that uh, I've heard it before on the radio, and it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, it's written by, this guy's a worship leader, but he also, I think he went on American Idol and did awesome things. But this song really speaks to what I'm talking about today, which is we're not promised. We're not promised. <laughs> but this is the chorus of the song. It says, because if I never see the promise... On this side of the grave, my hope might be shaken, but my faith will never break. Because I know the day is coming when you'll right all the wrong. So I'll praise you in the waiting, and my faith will stay strong. I don't know what it is in your life that you've stopped praying for. You've prayed so many times that you've just kind of given up even praying whether it's a brokenness inside of you or a relationship that you wish could be restored or a family member or a friend that you wish would come to know Christ. Maybe you've given up praying for those things because you've prayed for so long. I want to, today, we want to give you an opportunity to just bring that before God. Right now. We're in a series called Hearing from God and so today we want to give you a chance to sit right now and hear from God. There's nowhere you have to go. The kids are okay in their programming. The teenagers are eating their pancakes. Right now, I want you to just sit and receive from God. Let him speak to you today. There's going to be some care team over by the cross if you want someone to pray with you right now. And right now in this moment, you can sit there. You can just, you can sing the song if you know the song. Or you can just sit, listen to the lyrics. Listen to, as Nate sings it over you. And just bring that thing that you don't think before God. Let God speak to you right now. If you're online or you're watching this later, we have people who want to pray for you. At any time during the week, if you're ever struggling and you need to know that someone's praying for you, we have a place where you can fill that out, newbreak.church slash prayer. And there's people who are ready and willing and wanting to pray over you. Every Wednesday at 6 a.m., this room has people in here praying over prayer needs, prayer requests at all of our campuses. We have people who are praying on a weekly, daily basis for the needs because we believe in the power of prayer and partnering with you. And we, would, we know that there's people that want to journey with you through whatever it is that you're struggling with. But right now, would you let God be the one who meets you where you are. As God sent an angel to Elijah, he will be present with you right now in this moment. And if you've never allowed God to speak to you, let him speak to you today.
taught me to trust you You showed me how to believe You're the author and the finisher Of what you started me So I'm not gonna doubt it I'm gonna hold on to peace Cause if I have it, you and nothing else I still have everything but if I never see the promise on this side of the grave, my home might be shaken, but my faith will never break. Cause I know the day is coming when you right all of the wrongs. So I'll praise you in the waiting, and my faith will stay strong. If I us have been walking through something, walking through a season, when you hear a song like that, and I think of my mom, she's experiencing sickness more and more and again and again, my own personal sicknesses and things I have. I've met with you and I've talked with many of you and what you're going through in your families or relationships. And then a song like this comes on and, and while I'm waiting, God, I want the answer to be today. And I'm like, right here, I want it. But Lord, you've been faithful. So it helped my faith remain strong. I love that question Pastor Joanne asked. What have you stopped praying for? And immediately I was convicted. I started to think of the things I have stopped praying for. And it was, it was one of those moments where, where I felt I heard God and he spoke this to me. And I wonder who else he wants to speak it to. He says, why have you stopped praying if my son is seated at my right hand and he has never stopped praying for you? We serve a God who is praying for us. And he says, I'm praying for you. Would you just speak to me because I hear you? So I'm gonna invite you to stand. And still in this moment of just being ready to hear from God, I wanna pray for you. We'll have continual people praying over at the cross. If you want someone to pray with you, whatever circumstance you're going through, you can meet us outside at the blue tent for more prayer. But I just wanna pray over you before we go, that we would just receive what God wants to speak to us. So Lord, we come before you now. Lord, with different things on our mind, things that we've been carrying for so long, and you've asked us to place it at your feet. Lord, maybe today is the day when, when we start praying in a way that says, God, you can have it. Do what you will. And Lord, even those moments, as Pastor Joanne shared, when we feel like we haven't heard you and you haven't responded, remind us. Your response may be wait. Your response may be trust. Your response may be not yet. Your response may be run and go. But Lord, we just want to hear you. Let our hearts hear you. Let our faith stay strong. Let us be changed forever. Let us be the light to others that are walking in darkness. Lord, we re receive every word that you're speaking to us. And we ask that we'd be changed forever. In your name we all pray. Amen. Give God a hand because he hears us. Amen.